Welcome back to When Harry Met Board Games, where we feed our people with relatable content and our victory condition is your satisfaction. I'm Harry, and before we go any further, please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click on that bell notification. That way, when we are doing our thing, YouTube lets you know. Also, check in the description down below for a link to our Patreon account and see how you can support this channel. Today, we have another episode of Board Game Review. Today, I'm going to be reviewing this game right here, Sola Fide, designed by Jason Matthews and Christian Leonard and published by Stronghold Games. I'm going to set the game up, show you how it plays, and then we'll get back to hear my final thoughts. So this is what the game looks like set up. This is a two-player only game where players take asymmetric sides, one player controlling the Roman Catholic Church, represented in color black, and the other player representing the Protestant Reformation, re represented by the color red. And they get their uh, influence cubes and their starting decks in those respective colors. We also have some reward cubes here that will be assigned according to specific gaming conditions. We have these uh, power cubes, which we do to designate the who has power within the given regions i'll explain that shortly we have a die that will be rolled from time to time by the roman catholic player and we have this token which is referred to as the disputation token which gains players certain extra rewards when they claim territories in which this piece is located we have a few additional decks here that players can gain as bonuses and or rewards and this is the main board, which is a board comprised of a bunch of modular tiles, but they're always placed in the same exact way in numerical order. You have the number one, two, and three tiles, it's forming like a pyramid, here on the top, and they will start the game face up, but the four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten tiles will start the game face down. Each of these tiles has the name of the location. These are referred to as the imperial circles. Here you have a map of northern europe and here you have the shaded area which represents the geographical location that's being mentioned here which in this case is upper saxon on the bottom here you have the amount of victory points all of these locations are worth either seven or nine victory points so some of these locations are more valuable than others and that is something to keep in mind so we also have this power track here which represents which of the two people groups is more influential so for example here this crown and this upper half represents the nobles and the bottom half here represents the peasants so this cube here designates that the yellow the yellow power cube begins the game here on the side of the nobles so that means the nobles have more influence in upper saxon and they're the ones that you're trying to win over in order to take over of this um, area. However, as the game progresses, players can make decisions that shifts the power downward towards the uh, peasants, and therefore the peasant side of the board is the part of the board that players will be fighting over to compete and spread their influence. Now, these different squares here represent the area majority spaces where players will be placing their cubes, but some of these spots are already pre-designated for a particular player so for example all of these pre-designated uh, red spaces are in favor of the protestants all of these black pre-designated spaces are in favor of the catholics so they don't even need to win majority there however if an opponent places their color cube on one of those spots then they have taken it away from their opponent then there are these places here that are neutral which both players will have to fight over whenever a player completely fills all five spots on the side in which the power cube finds itself on then they will claim that territory okay so there is that okay then each player has their starting deck which by the way at the beginning of the game what happens is you have a little card draft where you will be taking three cards at a time looking at them and doing some deck constructing. You're gonna pick two out of those three cards and those two cards will be added to your deck and you'll discard the other one. Then you'll rinse, wash, and repeat. Keep on drawing three cards, choosing two based on which what your preferences or strategies are and discard one until you finally have a starting deck of 30 cards. This game, it doesn't matter who starts, players can roll off or find some other randomized fashion of deciding who will go first. And each player starts with a starting hand of three cards. You can never have more than five cards in your hand at the end of a turn. 
If you ever have more than five cards at the end of a turn, then you will be forced to discard until you are down to only five. Okay, so I will start with the Roman Catholic player. And basically on your turn, you have one of two options. You can either uh, draw a card from your deck to add it to your hand for your future turn. You won't do nothing else on the turn. Or you can play one card from your deck. So I have all these cards. I have Swingley's Friendly re uh, Rejoinder to Luther. I can remove all tokens from territories on the nobility side. However, there are no tokens on the board as of yet. It says here, a man for all seasons. Move the disputation token to any imperial circle, then draw one card. So whenever you have the disputation token somewhere, it's going to gain players an additional bonus. Normally, when you claim a, tur a circle, you will always gain that tile. You will put it in your supply, and it will give you victory points at the end of the game. Uh, also, you get the bonus of claiming one of these foreign influence cards in any color of your choice. And the different colored cards do different things. They have different benefits and different advantages to them. But if the uh, disputation token happens to be on a tile, then players will claim an additional bonus for claiming that territory. Uh, and, the ter and the bonus would be one of these reward tokens. And these reward tokens are worth additional victory points at the end of the game. So I could play this A Man for All Seasons card to try to get the Disputation token onto a location. Or I could play this card here, Erasmus Attacks Luther. Convert one territory on the nobility side in a single imperial circle, then shift that circle one space towards the no nobility. Oh, never place this back here. So I am going to, I am going to play this Erasmus card. I get to play, um, I get to convert one territory. And there's three different ways of converting a territory. Um, either you take a neutral uh, location, a neutral spot, or a spot in the opponent's color, and place your colored cube on that spot. That's converting a territory. Or if you remove, let's say, an opponent's piece from a, pre, uh, a spot that was original in your color... That's another way of converting a space. Um, and finally, you can replace, let's say, a neutral spot. You can replace an opponent's cube with your cube, and that would be another way of converting. So I have a black cube. I'm going to place it on the nobility side in a single imperial circle. I'm not going to choose these two locations here because these two locations are currently favoring the peasants. So I'm actually going to place it here. I'm going to cover up one of these red spots. And it allows me to move the power cube up one on the nobility track. So now it's in the furthest spot of the nobility track, securing the fact that it would be harder for the opponent to bring it down to the opposite track. Okay, so the Catholic player is done with their turn. And now the Protestant player will go. And he's got some interesting card. Uh, Paul, Pope Paul IV, the book banner. Select any one card from those not chosen during deck building. Add it to your hand and then remove this card from play. That's cool just in case for whatever reason, for luck purposes, there might have been a really good card that did not make it into your starting deck because you had three cards and you only had two to pick from. So that might uh, be interesting later on. To the Christian nobility of the German nation, I can convert all natural neutral territories in the Franconian and Lower Saxon imperial circles. So this is Lower Saxon and this is Franconian. So, ooh, you know what? This is a pretty good card. So I am going to do that. So we're going to play this card here. I'm going to convert all neutral territories. By the way, this card does not specify that it has to be on the nobility or on the... Um, uh, peasant side of the board. So it's just all neutral territories. So right here, uh, I got to pick one of these locations though. Um, oh no, convert all neutral territories in the Franconian and Lower Saxon. So it's both. This is an amazing card. All right, so here we go. Look at that. The Protestant player is off to a start here. There's just They're just one cube away from gaining this one right here. Okay. So they are done with their turn, and now it is the Catholic player. Um, 
So the Catholic player is actually going to choose to draw a card. We don't really like the choices we have right now. So we're just going to draw a card, okay? And then the human player will go again. He only played one card. Sorry about that. Let's see what we want to do. Convert all neutral territories in the Upper Rhenish Bavarian. We do not have that uh, location available yet. So you know what? We're going to play this Pope Paul IV card. We're going to look at the 15 cards that didn't make it to the game and see which one we would want. Uh, let's see. Move the Disputation Token. Convert one territory on the subordinate side. Um, convert one territory on the subordinate side. The subordinate side, by the way, the, the cards refer to the dominant side and the subordinate side. The dominant side is the side in which the power cube finds itself on. The subordinate card uh, side is the side on which it's not on. So quite often these cards might help you with the subordinate side, but your hope and expectation is that in the future you, you shift things and you make a power ship to change which side is dominant and which side is subordinate. Convert all neutral territories in the Upper Rhenish and Swabian Imperial Circles. I think I already have that card. It's something... It's a different title. Okay, it has some overlap. Um, convert all neutral territories in the Westphalian... Mm, these are some pretty good cards. Convert one territory on the commoner side. You know what? I am going to grab another one of these um, convert all neutral territory cards. Because that's very, very helpful. Okay. So, <clears throat> now it's the Catholic player's turn again. And let's see this card that I drew. So, I drew this card, Battle of Mulberg. And this sword symbol that you find on the two lower corners here represents that this is a military card. The Catholic deck, in particular, has these military cards that every time you play it, and after you resolve the text on the card, you must roll this die and then compare the result of the die roll with this military chart here. And what happens is, depending on the die roll, there are some possible detrimental effects that the Catholic player will incur. So that's something to think about every time you play a military card. So this says, discard two cards from your hand to convert two territories on the nobility side in a single imperial circle. So I might just do that. So I'll discard two cards. Truth is, I am not too interested in these. And by the way... When you go through your discard pile, eventually you shuffle your cards and create a deck again. So I'm going to discard those two cards. And here I got the Battle of Mulberg. I'm going to play it. Uh, first, I'm going to resolve it, which I discarded the two cards. Now I'm going to convert two territories. So I'll place this black cube here on that red spot. And I'll place this other black cube here on this neutral spot. And now the black player is just one spot away from winning over that location. Okay. So, now we will roll the die here, and I rolled a 3, and we're going to compare that 3 with the military chart right here, which says, Schmal, Schmalkatic League Victory. The Catholic player immediately discards one card. Well, guess what? I have no cards, so luckily for me, that didn't necessarily hurt me. Okay, we're going to move on to the next player, the Protestant player's turn, and both of these cards affect regions that are no not visible right because again these places are not visible um by the way every time you claim a territory you immediately reveal the t two territories immediately beneath it so for example once this territory is claimed these two will be revealed once this territory is claimed these two will re re be revealed and so on and so forth and that way progressively the board becomes available for you. So this player is not going to choose to do anything with his turn other than draw a card, right? And now we'll go to the Catholic player. Has no cards in his hand, so he is obligated to draw a card with his action. Now let's see what the Protestant player will do. Uh, the Protestant player drew a new card here, which says, Philip the, Mag the Magnanimous. Philip the Magnanimous, Landgrave of Hesse. It says, convert one territory on the nobility side in a single imperial circle and then shift that circle one space towards the nobility side. So they're not going to do the shifting part because they're going to choose this location here. And it's already at its maximum as far as the power side. But they are going to use that to convert one location. So they're going to remove this black cube here from this neutral spot and give it back to the, play, the other player and they're going to place their own red cube here and slow them down as far as that location is concerned all right now it's the catholic player's turn and they're going to play ursulines 
uh, or Ursulines. Or, or it says, convert one territory on the commoner side in a single imperial circle and then draw one card. So this is actually great because, first of all, it's going to let me draw a card so I won't be empty-handed. And it lets me convert somebody in the commoners or the peasant side of the board, which is great because right here, the Protestant player was just one spot away from securing this place and getting his points. So I'm just going to convert this one right here, place my black cube, and now slow them down and draw a card at the end of my turn. All right, now the uh, Protestant player will go, and again, they're going to draw a card, because they don't have much they could do right now. The Catholic player is going to look at this card they just drew, Lepanto. It says, convert one territory each on both the nobility and the commoner side in a single imperial circle. So this is a tough one, but you know what? Let's go for the victory. We're going to convert one right here, and for the heck of it, convert one right here on the peasant side so we're done with that and the protestant player will look at their newly drawn card and it's the adoration of the sacrament convert all neutral territories in the westphalian and austrian oh no we already had that oh no we didn't have that so i got a bunch of cards here Ooh, upper saxon you know what this might not be bad so the protestant player you know what they're going to save this Austrian and Pearl Circles. They're going to save this for the future. We're going to leave the Upper Saxon there. They're just going to draw a card. They're not going to mess anymore with the Catholic. Sometimes in this game, you got to pick and choose which areas you're going to fight for. Wait a second. Sorry. I draw one card with my Catholic player's turn. Now we move on to the Protestant player's next turn. And they just have a bunch of... There's a lot of these cards here that convert all neutral territories. And again, a lot of these are not relevant. So the Protestant player is going to draw another card, and their hand is at five. So this is the hand limit. They're not going to have to discard down, but in a future turn, if they don't start spending some of these, they are going to have to discard them. All right, it's the Catholic player's turn. Let's see what we have. We have the Veneration of Mary. Shift every Imperial Circle one space towards the commoner side. I do not want to play that right now because I would not want to risk lowering this to the commoner side. So instead, the Catholic player will just draw a card. And now the Protestant player will look at their hand. Here we go. The Augsburg Confession. Convert one territory on the nobility side in a single imperial circle and then move the disputation so token to that circle. You know what? They're not going to want to do that because, again, the Catholic player is fighting really hard for this. And if they move the disputation token there, it's very likely the Catholic player is going to win and end up getting bonus points for having the disputation token. So instead... They're going to draw a card, and now they are forced to discard because they have six cards at the end of their turn. So I will discard one card right here. And now the Catholic player will go. And it says here, we have this card here, the University of Paris. Convert one territory on the dominant side in a single imperial circle, and then move the disputation token to that circle. So that's amazing. I'm going to convert one territory on the dominant side. And I'm going to choose here. It says uh, in a single imperial circle, so it doesn't specify which location. I'm going to put it on that neutral location, and I will move the disputation token here. And because I have completed all five of these spots here in my player color, and the power cube is on the nobility as far as the dominant side is concerned, I claim this territory for myself, clear it of all cubes. I gain this and put this in my pile my victory point pile gives me seven victory points and because there's a disputation token there i gain one of these green reward tokens which are each worth one victory point at the end of the game also i pick from these foreign influence piles which all have their different perks or different benefits and i draw one card and resolve its benefit immediately so i drew this orange card here which says edict of blood discard any number of cards from your hand and then draw that same number of cards so let's see. I have only one card here. The Veneration of Mary. You know what? I'm probably not going to use this card right now. So I am going to discard it and draw one card. And this is pretty much the way the game plays. Players keep on carrying out their actions, resolving their player cards and their abilities, vying for control in all the different locations, placing their cubes, removing their opponent's cubes, collecting each of these regions one by one, adding them to their victory piles, until all 10 locations 
have been claimed. Once all 10 locations have been claimed, players tally up their points, which is a combination of the victory point symbols on their tiles, plus any additional reward tokens that they had claimed throughout the game. And the person with the most points is the winner of the game. Let's get back to here, my final thoughts and grades. So that is how you play Sola Fide. Let's get straight to my grades. First, we're gonna talk about components where I'm gonna give this a grade of A-. minus. This is a card-driven game where there are some tiles representing the different geographical locations that players are vying for. There's some cubes and what have you. But for the purpose of this game, there is no need to have extravagant or luxurious type of gaming components. So it gets the job done. Uh, it's not... Uh, amazing the graphic design can stand to improve and even the box cover art is a little plain and maybe even boring so because of that it won't get the complete a but i'm going to give it an a minus now let's talk about theme for theme i'm going to give this a b minus and for those who know the history of sola fide and its design its development its publication and republication you will know that sola fide was originally designed as campaign manager 2008 simulating the presidential election uh, or race or competition between Barack Obama and John McCain. And the idea that they could take that game that wasn't very successful, not that this game has, you know, blown the charts as far as sales is concerned. They take that old intellectual property, well, not intellectual property, but they take that old theme and they rebrand it with a Reformation theme. At surface level, that makes you think, well, this game cannot be very thematic because this is the definition of an unthematic game. You could take one theme and then repaste another theme. But I'm still going to give this a B- minus because I think they did it justice. I feel like the different cards that you play out and different actions that you carry out, they all make sense from a historical perspective. They have nice little flavor text or, or text that is relevant to the actual events that transpired during this time in 16th century Europe. So I find it to be neat, and I think they did a really good job of borrowing uh, this older skeleton or system, gaming system, and reskinning it with a theme and doing it justice. So B minus for theme. Now we're gonna move on to gameplay. And for gameplay, I'm gonna give this a B plus. Uh, my favorite part about this game, perhaps, and I think it's a solid game, my favorite part is perhaps the deck building or the deck construction that takes place before the game takes place where you select three cards at a time. Each player selects three cards at a time and chooses two of those cards to be in their deck and excludes the other one and they build their 30 card deck or so. I find that to be cool. I find that to be neat um, and it's a little bit of a decision uh making process before the actual game proper even begins and it can be frustrating when perhaps you get three amazing cards uh at the same time within the first three cards that you choose and you can only pick two out of those three amazing cards and you're like oh why did it have to line up that way and um and then you get two trashy three trashy cards in, in another draft and now you gotta keep two trashy cards or maybe not trashy but less valuable cards in your opinion you gotta keep them in your deck so that could be a little bit frustrating. The area majority is nice and neat. I'm a big fan of area majority. It's really kind of like a tug of war type of area majority because um, the majority or the influence is represented by the pushing back and forth of that cube. So that's a little bit different than just adding more and more pieces. And again, this is a two player only game. So it's a neat way of carrying out that area majority idea in what's only a two player game because usually with these kind of games, or area majority games, you need three, four, maybe even five players for the game to truly thrive. Um, this game is completely card driven as far as the actions that you take. And I find that to be really, really neat. Um, now we're going to talk about novelty factor. And for novelty factor, I'm going to give this a C plus. And the reason why I'm giving it a C plus is because there are a lot of things that are not necessarily unique to it. I mentioned the card driven aspect of this game. There are other area majority, area control games where you use cards to drive the actions you take. For example, the grandfather of all area majority games, El Grande, pretty much established and pioneered that mechanism where on the basis of a card draft, which is on a communal um, lineup of cards that players can choose from, from that line of, of cards, you choose these cards and they give you specific actions and they also control the area majority game that you're doing. They 
designate how many pieces you can pl place. And it's pretty much the same thing with this game. The cards tell you, you know, which particular regions you can influence, how many spaces you can influence, which particular tracks you're in gonna influence, whether it's the nobles or it's the peasants, uh, whether it's the track that determines which one takes priority. All of these things are driven by the card. So again, that part uh, is not unique, but I do find that the two separate tracks for the area majority combined with that third track that determines um, which people group has the priority or the influence within that region, I find that to be really, really neat because usually in area majority, it's a little bit more cookie cut than that as far as how to win that area majority. You, you go and you try to have the majority in this particular uh, place and that's how you do it. In this game, you try to reach a certain level within the track, but even so, you might be focusing on one track, perhaps even neglecting the other, because that track is the track that that particular region is giving priority to. But players, your opponent, can take actions that push that cube on the other track downward or upward and change which group takes precedence, whether it's the nobles or the, um, the peasants. I find that to be really, really cool. It's a nice little wrinkle. It's not no nothing that blows your mind away. But again, because of that particular mechanism, I think that it warrants me giving this at least a C plus for novelty factor. That two track or three track system for the area majority location. And finally, we're going to say the overall grade. And I'm going to give this a B. This is a solid game. I'm a big fan of Jason Matthews. I think he does a really good job of taking historical themes and implementing them in gameplay fashion in a way that a person can have a good time. It's enjoyable. It's um, stimulating. It feels very thought out and strategic and tactical. So there's no complaints in that regard. This is definitely on the lighter end of his games. But I think that actually can be looked at as a plus because this is the kind of game that perhaps you might want to teach a casual gamer friend of yours before you jump them up to the next step, like a game like Twilight Struggle or games like 1989 or even games like 1960, which are not quite as heavy as those games, but a little bit heavier than this one. So overall grade B. Thank you so much for joining us, guys. Consider clicking on one of the videos that you see on the screen right now. Also, check in the description down below for a link to our Patreon so you can see how you can support this channel and become more involved with the behind the scene process. Research and find a tier that works for you. This is Harry saying take care everybody, stay safe, stay healthy, and have fun gaming. Bye-bye.